Gregor's holdfast in the hands of King Aegon and Prince Viserys after their victory over the Kingsguard, Sir Armory Peak, the rest of the Red Keep was in the hands of Sir Marsden Waters and the remaining members of the Kingsguard, whilst beyond the castle, Sir Lucas Laygood and his gold cloaks kept a firm grip on King's Landing. While the Red Keep was in lockdown, the Kingsguard coup was still in progress, but none beyond the wall had any idea of the events happening inside the castle walls. Both Waters and Laygood presented themselves before the gates of Maegor's Holdfast the next morning to demand that the king leave his sanctuary. Your grace does us wrong to think we mean him harm, Sir Marsden said, as the corpses of the men Shandok the Shadow slain were brought up from the dry moat below. We acted only to protect your grace from false friends and traitors. Sir Armory was sworn to protect you, to give his life for yours if need be. He was your little man, as am I. He don't deserve such a death at the hands of such a beast. But King Aegon was unmoved and stern. Shandok is no beast, he answered from the battlements. He cannot speak, but he hears and obeys. I commanded Sir Armory to be gone, and he refused. My brother warned him what would happen if he stepped beyond the axe. The vows of the King's Guard include obedience. I thought, we are sworn to obey the King, sire. This is so, replied Sir Marsden, and when you are a man grown, and can rule in your own right without the need for regents. My brothers and I will gladly fall upon our swords should you command that of us. So long as you remain a child, however, we are required by oath to obey the king's hand, for the hand speaks with the king's voice. Lord Thaddeus is my hand, Aegon insisted. Lord Thaddeus sold your realm to Lys. I must answer for it. I will serve as your hand until such time as his guilt or innocence can be proven. Sir Marsden unsheathed his sword and went to one knee, saying, I swear upon my sword in the sight of gods and men that none shall do you harm whilst I stand beside you. If the Lord Commander believed those words would sway the king, he could not have been more wrong. You stood beside me when the dragon ate my mother, Aegon answered. All you did was watch. I will not have you watch while they kill my brother's wife. Then he left the battlements, and no more words of Marsden Waters could induce him to return the next day, or the next, or the next. On the fourth day, Grandmaze the Munkin appeared together with Sir Marsden. I beseech you, sire, end this childish folly, and come out, that we may serve you. King Aegon gazed down on him, saying naught, but his brother was thus resented, commanding the Grand Maester to send forth a thousand ravens so the realm might know the king was being held captive in his own castle. To this, the Grand Maester made no answer, nor did the ravens fly. In the days that followed, Monkey made several further appeals, assuring Aegon and Viserys that all that had been done was lawful. Sir Marsden went from pleas to threats to bargaining and back to pleas again. The Septon Bernard was brought forth to pray loudly for the crone to light the king's way back to wisdom, all to no avail. These efforts drew little or no response from the boy king. Beyond a sullen, stubborn silence, his grace was roused to anger only once, when his martyr at arms, Sir Garth Long, took his turn attempting to convince the king to yield. And if I will not, who will you punish, sir? King Aegon shouted down at him, you may beat poor Gaiman Powerhead's bones, but you will get no more blood from me. Many and more have wondered at the seeming forbearance of the new hand and his allies during the stalemate. Sir Marsden had several hundred men within the Red Keep. Sir Lucas Laygood's gold cloaks numbered more than 2,000. Magor's Holdfast was a formidable fortress, to be sure, but was weakly held of the Lysini who came to Westeros with Lady Lara, only Shandok the Shadow, and six more remained at her side. The rest had gone with her brother Moredo to the Vale. A few men loyal to Lord Rowan had made their way to Magor's before the doors were closed, but there was not a knight or a squire or a man at arms amongst them, nor amongst the king's own attendants. There was one knight of the king's guard within the Holdfast, who said Renyard Roskin was a prisoner, having been overwhelmed and wounded by the Lysini at the very start of the king's defiance. Marshall tells us that Queen Daenerys' ladies donned mail and took up spears to help make it appear that King Aegon had more defenders than he did. This ruse could not have fooled Sir Marsden and his men-at-arms for long, if indeed it did fool them at all. Thus the question must be asked. Why did Sir Marsden not simply take the whole fast by force? He had more than enough men, or some would have been lost to Shandok and the other Lysini. Even the Shadow would surely have been overwhelmed in the end. Yet the hand held back, continuing his attempts to end the secret siege with words. 
open swords would have most likely have brought it to a quick conclusion. To this very day, some assert that Sir Marsden Waters was no more than a cat's paw, a simple honest knight used and deceived by men more subtle than himself. Whilst others argue that Waters was part of the plot from the beginning, but turned upon his fellows when he sensed the tide turning against them, the secret siege saw no sign of an end, and the standoff became even more perilous as each day passed, and as each side was backed into a corner, days ticked by, it more and more likely blood would be spilled, as until Sir Marsden Waters made one vital misjudgment 